here we are for another month. Like I said, we've got plenty of stuff to cover this month. There's lots of information to go through. For those that haven't met me, yes, I am the class clown. My name's Dan. I'm the training and adoption practice manager for ICOM. Um, and we also cover all of the other cloud collective partners across all of the Microsoft clouds. Today's agenda, like we said, packed one. We've got lots and lots to talk about. I'm going to go through the feature roundup nice and quickly. Uh, we've got a few interesting updates for you and some coming soons. And then our guest of honor who's just jumped in, Mario De Silva from Microsoft. Mario's got the goods on Copilot and he's going to show us some really cool stuff. Um, Copilot continues to be the hot topic in modern work and uh, in the technology realm. So Mario's got the goods for us today. And then Justin's going to talk about Teams 2.0. Without further ado, should we kick in and just go straight through what's new in modern work? We'll start off with a Teams update, um, a sort of heavy Teams update month again this month, which is good to see that there are still the updates coming through on Teams. It's not just stagnant technology that's left to do its thing. We are getting constant updates come through. Uh, the first one that I want to talk about is external presenter links, which put a massive smile on my face when I saw this come through. Anyone that's tried to run uh, webinars or meetings with an external presenter knows the frustration of um, having to have that person as a guest in your organization or bring them into the meeting and then changing their role once they're brought in. However, now organizers can set up events and with very minimal effort at an external presenter, so someone external to your organization who gets um, a different or an exclusive and customized Teams join link for all of those external presenters. So these links will enable the external parties to directly enter the event as a presenter. So it eliminates the need for them to join the meeting or come through the lobby and then be uh, upgraded to a presenter once they're in the meeting. This is all about creating a, a more hassle-free event experience for anyone that's running, running events, webinars, uh, meetings with external parties presenting. Um, so this is at the moment available for webinars only. It's not a Teams premium feature. So it is across all Teams licenses, and you should see this rolling out towards late October, and it will be in the typical staggered fashion. So you might hear of some tenants getting it, but yours not yet. It will come through by end of October, I'm told, and that's an exciting one. So you can see in the screen grab there on the basic info for the webinar at the bottom, you can see there's a separate section for external presenters. Type the email address in and you're good to go. So that's a welcome addition. Uh, the other interesting one that's come through for Teams is immersive spaces. So the next step in Microsoft's mesh world. So this is all about better engagement and different sorts of engagement in remote and hybrid meetings. And it does roll the spatial audio and 3D environment into the immersive space. So Microsoft to bring the power of that um, mesh workflow into your flow of work and meetings. So it makes it easier for users to, I guess, Really transform your stereotypical meeting like we're in now into a 3D experience. So with just one or two clicks now, you can easily have a different and um, fun and connective 3D environment as we can see there in the screen grab. Once you're in that virtual space, you can choose from a variety of different environments and experiences with spatial audio that have been built in. At the moment, there's only a couple that have been put in there, but there is plans to expand this over time to have um, <clears throat> more virtual spaces and immersive spaces in there. Uh, so available on PC, or if you're lucky enough to have one of the MetaQuest VR devices, it is available on the VR device. So you can sit there in a virtual immersive space with your VR headset on um, and it looks, looks pretty cool. So at the moment it's available on Windows PC and MetaQuest VR. No news if um, the sad Mac users like myself, yeah, look, Joe, yeah, no word on whether we're gonna get it just yet. Um, but yeah, for the Windows users, you'll start seeing that rolling out in late October. Uh, Town Hall. Has anyone heard of the updates for Town Hall coming through? Has anyone seen the news about that yet? Yeah, a couple of yeah, a couple of raised thumbs there. Okay, so the goal behind this is simplifying the virtual event experience in Teams. So Teams, uh, Microsoft are integrating live event capabilities into Teams meeting experiences. So think of this 
Town Hall, essentially this is a replacement for live events moving forward. Um, but this is kind of moulding the, the, the best of both worlds, right? So the wider scale functionality of a team's live event, uh, but with that sort of customization and all the options available to you and that interactivity in a two-way event like a meeting or a webinar. So this is a new experience to host and deliver larger scale internal events. So town halls will provide the typical live event style one-to-many format uh, with all of the advanced production capabilities that you're used to in a live event with structured approaches to these meetings. And like I said, that customization and all of that functionality um, of a webinar. So really useful for town hall style uh, town hall style events. Think of things like a company wide town hall or an all hands meeting, even like your fireside chats. Um, so this is available now. So it launched um, September 30. Sorry, it launched last week. But as of September 30 next year, Teams live events won't be supported and access will be discontinued. So if you're still running Teams live events, you've got 12 months to do it at which point that will be cut off and Town Hall will be that experience moving forward. Um, we've started playing with it a little bit, so if you do want a bit of a hand or if you want to know more, reach out to us so we can explain the differences in a bit more detail than what we're going to go through today. Um, but it does look like a really useful step forward. Uh, John Moving away from Teams, we're going to talk Outlook for a second. Uh, we've got this really cool one for time zone notifications. So automatic notification for different time zones, web version only at the moment. So every time you schedule a meeting in Outlook on the web, you'll get a tooltip pop up uh, in the case that some of your attendees are in a different time zone. As soon as you open that new event to compose it and put all of that information together, that tooltip will jump out at you and let you know to navigate over to the scheduling assistant, which will help you as the organizer pick the right time based on local time for all of your participants. So you'll be able to see that and pop up straight away, saving hopefully the headache of sending it and then getting people coming back and telling you that, oh no, sorry, I'm in Perth. And you know, that's 4 a.m. for me, I'm not gonna join that. So really useful um, tool tip that pops out. Like I said, web version at the moment, uh, no word on when it will be rolling out to the desktop versions, but a safe assumption that it will be not too far away, and it is available now. So you should see that in Outlook for web now. Our next Outlook um, edition here is multi-tenant support. So you can see on the screen grab there when we're starting a live, uh, sorry, a Teams meeting from Outlook or scheduling a Teams meeting from Outlook, you can see that it's giving the option for your different tenants. So those of us who are part of multiple tenancies, uh, now you can schedule the meeting and run that meeting from that different tenant without having to switch in Teams and log in, log out and do all of that uh, mucking about. And now you can do it straight from the schedule Teams button and you'll be able to control it straight away and it will come from that tenancy. So you won't need to forward edit or change any of those settings. And that is also available now. So uh, those in multiple tenants, you should start seeing some benefit out of that pretty quickly. Very cool. Well, I've gone for a quick game's a good game because we've got way more important things to talk about. And uh, that is a wonderful cue to hand over to the man himself, Mario De Silva. So, Mario, are you with us? Thanks, Dan, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, hopefully, the next 20, 25 minutes, uh, I want to I've really spend some time. I know a lot of people have been hearing about Copilot out in the in the marketplace, but let me start off by introducing myself. Uh, Mario De Silva, I've been at Microsoft for 17 years. Makes me feel really old when I say that. This is my third stint at Microsoft, so I've left twice and come back. Shows that Microsoft's a great place to work. I work in a part of our business that really looks at hybrid work and the new solutions that are coming out in hybrid work and co-pilot being the one that seems to be sucking a lot of oxygen out there in terms of uh, engagement time, but where customers are most excited about as well. So I'm going to use a 
quick slide deck. I promise you this is not going to be that PowerPoint. Uh, I'll just share a quick deck to frame what is Copilot today, and then we can dive into demos. And my intention probably to do about 20 minutes of demos and maybe five minutes focused on positioning Copilot uh, and what it is. So I'm, I'm guessing most of you have heard of Copilot in one way or another. And there are different flavors of Copilot, and I want to set that record out there. The, the Copilot solution that I'm going to talk about is Microsoft 365 Copilot, which is in the top left-hand corner of your screen. But Microsoft's vision is to inject AI and a Copilot into all the end-user applications that people work with. So, for example, we've had GitHub Copilot that's been available for nearly 12 months now. And some of the stats that we're seeing from GitHub Copilot are phenomenal, right? Something like 47% of all the code generated in GitHub now is AI generated using Copilot. Uh, the satisfaction from developers is improved tremendously because what Copilot and the AI does is takes away all the mundane tasks that developers don't like to do, helps them with debugging, helps them with writing basic code, uh, looking for code samples and kind of getting them going quickly. So really driving productively up for that group of users. We will be announcing a security copilot. We've announced a Windows copilot that will replace Cortana as part of the Windows 11 update recently. So you will find copilots for different solutions. Now, some of them will be licensed like the M365 copilot that we're going to talk about today. Some of them will just be embedded in your platforms like you've got Whiteboard copilot, you've got OneNote copilot, which will just be part of the application itself. So let's jump ahead and and look at what is a copilot really. I'll skip these slides, these stats. I've spoken about some of this already. But really, what copilot is is an assistant for you in your day to day work. So we will inject AI and copilot, and you'll see it in the demos in all your office applications: Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Teams, Outlook. And we'll have a new capability that we're calling business chat or Microsoft chat. And, and what this is, is basically going to be an assistant for you working within those applications. And the easiest way I like to describe AI in this context is that it is, it's basically, think of everyone that has a co-pilot license as having a really efficient intern working for them. And that in turn does all the mundane drudgery of work, finding data sets, finding information, creating basic reports for you, doing all that grunt work up front, and getting it close enough to maybe 80% or 90% of the final artifact. And then you take control of that piece of work and you kind of refine it, validate it, and then publish it. And that's the intention of what Copilot is, is you as the end user are still in control, AI won't do anything you don't tell it to do. You have to create a prompt to get AI to give you a response, right? We've always had AI in our platform in Microsoft uh, with Teams meeting rooms, with people framing, and those kind of things. Is That's AI built in, which I call autopilot, which the platform does automatically. This is where the end user is in control of the actual AI engine. From a general availability perspective, it's not available today. We've got some early adopter customers using it today but it will be available from the 1st of November for people, customers like yourselves to go acquire the licenses if you think there's value in this and this will drive it, drive benefits for you. Me personally, my vision for Copilot with M365 is this is the first productivity tool that I've seen that adds, that drives productivity that could even justify a four day working week. Now that's a Mario vision for Copilot, not a Microsoft vision. A Mario vision is I can work four days a week if I choose to, <laughs> right? Uh, so hopefully you'll get a sense of that through the demos as well as we go through it. So what are the underlying components that make up Copilot? And the underlying components of Copilot is the large language model. Microsoft made a massive investment with OpenAI a little while back, 
And as part of that investment, we've got access to their chat GPT 3.5 and chat GPT 4 models that we built up in our Azure data centers. And that is what that large language model is. That is the AI engine that creates the output in in normal language that we understand. It's not machine language, it's normal human language and text that it creates. You then got your Microsoft graph, which some of you will know what that is, but basically the graph is your, your access to your data that is sitting on your M365 tenant. As part of Copilot, we've launched a new indexing capability as well called Semantic Index. And what Semantic Index is, Slightly different to your SharePoint index. Your SharePoint index is a keyword search index. Semantic index is, let's think of that on steroids. It, it's basically an index of your data as well as an index, as well as an index of the context of your organization. Uh, and then you've got the Microsoft 365 apps, which is all your Word, Excel, PowerPoint all your office applications really. And recently as part of the product evolution, we've added that integration into the internet as well. So it's not only grounded in your data, but if you create a prompt, for example, if I tell Copilot, go find me the weather report for tomorrow. I'm assuming that data is not sitting anywhere in your tenant and Copilot won't be able to find it on your tenant. So at that time, what it'll do is go up to the public internet and pull that data and present it back to you. The great thing is it'll give you the source of that data whenever it presents data back to you. So it'll tell you it pulled it off from Bureau of Meteorology, for example, right? So that is what Copilot is. And I'm guessing you'll get a better picture of it and the capabilities as we jump into a demo. In fact, in the interest of time, why don't we do that? So I'm gonna exit the slide deck and I'm gonna go into, into Teams over here. Uh, let me just do a search, which is a project. So there we go. I'm gonna look for Project Falcon, which is a fictitious project that some my colleagues and I created so that we could do demos with this particular meeting. So assume that you've had a meeting before taken place. I can go to the recap. What you can see on this recap over here is Teams Premium. This is not co-pilot. This is something you get, think of it as autopilot, where you get this if you've got a Teams, license, uh, Teams Premium license. It tells you summary notes, all those kind of things. And you get what you get with this, right? You cannot ask further questions of the AI with Teams Premium. What you'll notice over here is I've got this little nice co-pilot icon that I can hit and it'll pop up uh, previous prompts that I've used for a demo over here. But let me start off by saying, let, let's list the attendees and their roles. I made a few spelling mistakes over there. The AI will adjust for that. It'll ground the data properly and it'll come back and it'll list all the people that were in the meeting and how they introduced their roles in the meeting. So you don't have to take notes about, hey, who attended the meeting and what was the role they were doing in that meeting? The AI can do that for you using the transcription feature and the prompt that you just created. I could create about 50 prompts over here and we could probably spend 20 minutes just looking at the prompts in this one. But one that I think is quite interesting is creating a prompt that says, give me the sentiment of the meeting. And this is interesting because I'm telling an AI engine to tell me whether this meeting was a positive meeting, a negative meeting. What was the context of, what was the, sentiment in the meeting and and the ai will look at the engagement in the meeting and it'll come back and give me some feedback on the sentiment of the meeting so it says the meeting was mixed there was some excitement some challenges and some compromises and it tells you why it made that statement so for example you'll notice i can hover on any of these points over here that it's highlighted with the annotations at the end and i can see 
what Jason Flynn, for example, said at what times so I could go and play the recording and actually see hear him saying that at that point in the meeting. Now, like I said, I, there is lots of prompts that you can create. And AI, this AI is only for you as an individual. No one else can see it, except if I'm sharing my desktop like I am right now. Uh, so you can save time not having to take notes and doing follow ups. And the best part about this is I could tell it, give me all the follow up action items, copy it, attach it to a mail and send it to everyone saying these are the action items from the meeting. All right. So real quick productivity gain. Hmm less stress within a meeting, not having to take notes, those kind of things over here. So let me show you the AI in Word real quickly over here. So I've got a Word document open, a really old Word document, as you can see, it was created in 2007, to do with climate change plan out of the UK. Again, I've got my friendly assistant on the right-hand corner called Copilot that I can hit and it'll always pop up that right-hand panel for me. So I can say, you know what, someone send me a 30 page document, not really interested. Give me a quick summary of what this document is. And the AI will go through the document and summarize the document and give me a quick overview of the document. Now, I could be very specific if I wanted to. I could tell it, give me a one page summary and it'll give me enough content to fill a page. Or I could say, give me two pages. It's up to you really what your prompt is. The AI will generate output based on the prompt you created. So there you go, it says here's the summary of the document, all, all that kind of stuff, right? So it's giving me a quick summary. I can get a synopsis of the document without having to read the entire document. Now let's think this individual who created Paul White, whose name shows up at the bottom of the screen, sends me this document and says, Mario, can you review this document and give me any input to how we could improve the climate change plan? So instead of doing this, if I had to do this previously manually, I'd have to read the document, first of all, I'd have to get some good other examples of climate change plans from other organizations, read them, compare the two documents, and then provide feedback. What I can do over here is get AI to do that for me. So what can do better with this? And now what the AI will do again is do what I would have manually have done and spend probably a day doing it, if not longer, probably two, knowing me. Uh, it'll review the document that's on the screen. It'll go off and look at all the climate change plans that it's been trained on as part of the model, not your data, but public data that it's been previously trained on. And it'll come back and give me some suggestions on how this plan can be improved. All right, so you can see over here, it's come back and give me some suggestions uh, like in, uh, let's pick one increase investment in green technologies is one example that it's given me over here. I can copy this and send this off and something that would have taken me two days. I've just completed in 30 seconds and I can re look really smart about it. I would highly encourage you to review the document, though, please, because at the end of the day, this is not autopilot. This is copilot because if you're going to make it represent that this is the output is your work then you should do some sanity checking of of what it's created of course and that's the whole idea of copilot is the end user being in control of this so that's a great way just doing those simple tasks i've uh, saved probably probably an, uh, a day at least so far if not two days so let me do another task which is i'm just going to for the interest of this demo and uh, not fluffing around because sometimes I've found, because we are still in preview over here. I'm going to just copy the link to this file and let's use the example that uh, the team comes back to me and says, Mario, can you create a slide deck using this? This document, we need to present this to the board or to the, the branch in the UK. So great. Again, something that would have normally taken me maybe two days to do, starting off with a blank screen and me looking at that blank screen and trying to figure out what I'm going to put on paper over here, which is the hardest thing personally. I can hit Copilot and I can go here and say, uh, once Copilot loads up, it'll give me an option to like, okay, what can I tell Copilot to do? Okay, let me hit the get started button over here. Great. It says create a presentation. That's exactly what I need to do. And I can say using and 
I can use the slash now. I did find this was playing up for me yesterday. Let's see if it works today. For some reason, it doesn't want. Oh, there we go. It says type slash, and yet it doesn't do what I want it to. Anyway, it is in it is an early adopter program. It's in beta right now. So prior to GA, we'll have some of these feeding things resolved. So I'll, uh, I did press good. Uh, I didn't copy the link that I said I would. Sorry. Let me do that one more time. End user error in this case. And I'm going to just drop that in here. And I'm going to tell Copilot, go give me a first draft of this PowerPoint presentation I need to create. So again, what Copilot's going to do is look at that document that I've pointed it to. And it's going to go away and do what I've told it to. I could be very specific again here and say create a presentation with 15 slides, I didn't. So I'm leaving Copilot to make that judgment. What's the right number of slides for this pack based on the document that it's got over there. And it will take a little while because it's going through the entire document and it's looking at what's relevant to be put in a presentation and then it'll pull it back, right? So this demo today, we cannot use your corporate templates if you've got standard templates, but when we go GA by the 1st of November, the in plan is to have the ability to apply or point it to your standard templates so that any content it creates will use your standard colors and those kind of things over here. So there we go. Copilot's gone away and come back and it says, I've created a deck for you here. Uh, let's go through it. It's taken some graphics from the document that's there. It's tried to add some relevant imagery <laughs> related to climate change, as you can see over here. I can even scroll up and what it'll do is it'll give me talking points for each slide and it'll also give me the original content from the document at the bottom over there right so it's giving a reference point into the original content that it's taken to create this uh let me go at the bottom now we know this is a really old document right that i'm working off so i might want to add a current information with regards to microsoft's 2030 climate change plan so I'm going to tell Copilot add a slide on 2030. And off it will do. Now, this time I've not pointed it to a file or a location. What it's going to do now is look across the M365 tenant and look for any public information or information that I have permissions to that talk about Microsoft's 2030 climate plan ambitions. And it'll pull that, it'll package it and create one slide and add it over here. And I could tell it to create an FAQ at the end of the document, at the end of this as talking points, if you want to. You can tell, you can continue to iterate on this and that's the key thing, right? So I can continue to create prompts and refine the content that Copilot creates. And from a change management point of view, this is one of the key things like partners like Dan and the team can help you with is around that change management piece, which is all about helping you write great prompts so that you can be more productive. Now, what I've done today is really basic prompts, right? I've not done complex prompts in any shape or form over here. You can create complex prompts that can do things a lot better and could have drive better productivity gains for you. So that's a quick demo of, uh, I guess, Copilot and PowerPoint. I can go back to Word, for example, over here that we had as well. And I can do simple things like um, within the document, if there is something I want to get rewritten, for example, I might choose a paragraph and I can hit the Copilot icon over there and it's going to rewrite that paragraph for me and give me six different options of the rewrite, for example, right? So if it's not sounding the way I want it to, the AI engine can do, actually it's done three this time. I can also go to the extend and say, make it professional, make it a neutral language, casual language, concise. It's up to you what kind of style of writing you want to apply to that paragraph, right? And that's what the AI, so I'll give you examples. I've, we've got some customers on, EAP right now, early adopter programs, apologize for the acronyms. One of the CIOs that uh, we're working with kind of given us anecdotal feedback that it's helping him save an hour every day of the week.
by using Copilot. That's just the productivity gains. One of the side benefits he's seeing that is he's getting Copilot to write his emails for him and it's softening his communication style. Previously, people saw him as quite cut and dry and abrupt, but with AI, it's helping him soften his personality and helping him with that, right? So there's other side benefits, I guess, of using AI as that kind of engine. So let me show you, I mentioned business chat or Microsoft chat. And this is a capability that doesn't only look at what are you doing in words context? This goes across all your data in your Microsoft 365 tenant and also gets grounded on the internet side of things. So when I say that, let me give you an example. Uh, someone's asked me to talk to them about Bing Chat Enterprise at the last minute and I, I don't have a deck ready. I recall seeing a deck somewhere a little while back and I can't recall where that was, whether that was in a SharePoint site, whether that was in a OneDrive, that someone sent me a link in a meeting in a meeting or in 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 email and so what i can do now is get copilot to go troll through that data sources that are there within the tenant and find me the right content over here so i can tell it uh, find me a powerpoint deck on bing chat enterprise what what this is going to do is it's going to go through all the data sources in my tenant and try and find for me a PowerPoint deck on Bing Chat Enterprise. Now, if you recall earlier, I said we've got this new indexing called Semantic Index. What Copilot does is applies context to your that indexing. Or, or Semantic Index is indexing adds context to your data as part of that index. Oh, always great when Copilot lets you down. It's comforting to know that the demo gremlins attack you as well, Mario, as long as it's, it's not just us. Let's let's try take two. Should have probably said slide deck and be very specific. It might go and try and find an outdoor pagola deck for me. Let's see how it does. <laughs> but when I was talking about semantic index and the context that I'm referring to here is what I would expect Copilot to come back and give me is a few options of files on Bing Chat Enterprise, like it's loading right now, as you can see. But what it's done is it knows that Mariana in our marketing team is a lead for Bing Chat Enterprise. And it has prioritized content that Mariana has published. Right, so I'm not getting something that Dan's taken and downloaded and modified to the hill. That might not exactly be accurate. Not that disparaging anything Dan does, but it, it gives you the context of people that publish stuff within your organization. So if someone says in within your company, give me the latest sales figures. It knows that Anne in accounts publishes the monthly sales figures and it'll prioritize outputs from Anne so that you know that that's a valid source of data. And it'll also prioritize based on dates as well when that content was created. And over here, you can see I can expand the references and it'll give me the three different references that and locations for those files. And, and that way I know they've come from a reputable source and I can do that. I can even go here and say, summarize my calendar, which could be a mess for today. And it'll go through my calendar and list all the meetings that are there in my calendar and give me a one, a consolidated view over here of my calendar and activities for the day that I've got to do. All right, whoops, seem to be someone in demand. Everyone seems to be calling me today during the session, but you can see over here, there's a whole list of uh, appointments that I've got. It's gonna list out over here. So I can continue to do this. I could get go into Outlook and get uh, Copilot to respond to an email. I've just come back from leave last week uh, and I had, I've still got a large number of emails that I've got to triage. And what I can do is go to the top and tell Copilot is triage my mail and only highlight messages that I need to action. 
and it'll filter down 300 odd emails down to probably 15 or 20 and bury the noise. Now you can always go and read the other messages. We're not telling you to ignore those messages. It's just that Copilot's helping you prioritize where you spend your time, right? And, and so I'll, I'll leave you with that as a quick demo. Hopefully that gives you some insights of how Copilot can really help you or M365 Copilot, I should be very specific in the context of the demos that I've done, can really help you understand what kind of productivity gain that it can drive for you in your day-to-day -day activities. Very cool. Thank you so much, Mari. I really appreciate that. But let's hand over to Justin. We've said we're going to give him a bit of time. So let's give him a little bit of time. Everyone, round of applause, virtual round of applause for Justin, who's going to talk about Teams 2. Thanks, Dan, and uh, welcome all. If you don't know me, Justin O'Mara, Senior Pre-Sales Architect at ICOM. I, I talk, design, or consult on Microsoft Teams rooms or Teams calling. That, that's what I do here at ICOM. Outside of work, I'm basically an Uber driver for my two kids, taking them here, there, and everywhere. Um, but that's all right. And now they're starting to drive me here, there, and everywhere. So what I'm here to talk about today is Teams 2.0. So in the last week, Microsoft have announced general availability of a new Microsoft Teams application for Windows and for Macs. So this is essentially a new version of the Teams client and it's built from the ground up. So it's actually completely different in the back end, being a little bit technical, different um, protocols and JavaScripts and React scripts um, of what it's built on, but it's built from the ground up. So it, it's brand new and it, it works differently to the existing Teams client today. It's been in preview for about a month, maybe two months now for people to trial. Um, it does depend, so it, how to turn it on, you might be able to see the icon here, but I'll jump to my, my Teams client in a minute. Up the top, there is a join Teams. Now this is something that your organization actually needs to turn on. So you may not have this button, but if your organization has given you the ability to trial the new Teams 2.0, you'll have this button up the top. And uh, essentially to, to go to Teams 2.0, if you have, if your organization allows you to, you toggle that button on and it will actually sign you out of Teams, sign you into Teams with 2.0 and you'll be using the new version. So it's generally generally available as of the 5th of October. Where to get information? So I thought I'd give you some links today um, on Teams today. If you want to learn a little bit more about the, you know, the technical back end and, and some of the new features and functions. There's some two links on this page. You should be able to click. Oh, no, you won't be able to click the links. I'll get Dan to whack them in the chat because um, I'm sharing my desktop at the moment as opposed to Microsoft PowerPoint because I want to jump to my Teams client in a minute. But I'll put those two links in the chat. Um, some great resources there on where to find information about Teams 2.0 if you want to share that within your own organization or read a little bit more. But essentially, why would you go to Teams Auto? And there's sort of four main reasons, and there's lots of um, dot points within those own reasons. But the first is faster. It's two times faster than your Teams client than your Teams client that you're using today. So actually launching the Teams client, the application itself is faster. Joining joining meetings is faster. Switching chat or channels is faster and it consumes less memory on your computer. So if you're doing five things at once, like we all like to do, PowerPoint open, Excel open, Outlook open, and five different documents in each of those applications open, Teams will consume less memory with the version two. So that's probably the biggest, what I would say, one of the biggest reasons why you want to use version 2.0. Um, it's simpler to use. There's a, a few user interface changes. They're, they're quite hard to find if you don't know what you're looking for, uh, but it's a little bit simpler to use. It's smarter. So what um, Mario was uh, gracious to show us earlier, the Copilot in Teams, it's been built in Teams 2.0. So if you're using Teams 1.0, when Copilot becomes available, you'll need to be running the Teams 2.0 client to be able to use Copilot inside of Microsoft Teams. Um, so that's something to be aware of as well. 
and it's more flexible. And I think this is probably the big user benefit. Um, across, if you're in multiple tenants, uh, like I am, changing tenants whilst you're in a call or during a call um, is now possible and changing tenants is faster and also identifying messages from other tenants is now available in your own um, Teams client. And I suppose to me, that's the biggest benefit I get out of Teams 2.0 is being um, in multi multiple tenants and being able to communicate easier across those tenants. And before I jump into a quick demo, the when. Now, it's not easy to explain technically when you'll be forced or not forced, but when you'll be the default client is 2.0. What Microsoft's saying is most organizations are running what's called the current channel of Office 365. So in late October, so in let's say one to two weeks, Microsoft will make the Teams 2.0 client the default client for most organizations. That's assuming that your organization is running the current channel. Some organizers that organizations may run the monthly enterprise channel, which will happen in December too. So I would assume, and I'm, I'm guessing that most people on this call will either get it late October or December this year. By default, that means the client will you be opening is 2.0. So let's jump into the Teams client. So this is my Teams client. I'm running 2.0. You can see it's actually ticked on. I can tick it off if I want to, but I won't do that. Um, and you'll notice uh, up here, the top corner, I've got activity in your uh, other accounts and organizations. So up here, I've got Icom Australia. That's obviously I work for, but I'm part of the Cloud Collective. So I have a, a presence in the Antares tenant. We have some of our customers here um, and also Hobson's Bay is one of the ICOM customers and I'm part of their tenant. Um, and Microsoft, I'm part of the Microsoft tenant and I can switch tenants quite easily and quickly by just clicking into this. And you can see, yeah, I'm gonna do this live demo. I'm in a call and you can see I'll switch from the ICOM tenant into the Microsoft tenant and you can see ICOM's part of uh, the meeting room partner program at Microsoft and I was part of an airlift in 2021 um, and some TAP programs. So you can see switching tenants whilst I'm on a call and um, is quite easily and fast. And now I also get, I can see someone's put a posted a, a message up in there. I now know that I've got another message in another organization. So I've actually got an at mention in Microsoft. So I can get um, alerted to being at mentioned in a different tenant. So very, very useful for, for people or um, and staff that are across multiple tenants. And I think that's probably, for me, the biggest benefit of Teams so not only being able to be faster an organization. Now, there's a couple of settings that I wanna to highlight to the end users that might be useful um, in Teams 2.0. So if we click into settings in the normal method, and the first one I want to um, click on is the appearance and accessibility. By default, when you go to Team Soto, it will follow the operating system theme. Now, I choose to use a light theme. I don't like the dark mode on my PC. But in the light mode, you'll see that the banner up the top of the client is using the white or light theme of my operating system. Now, that annoyed me, I, I don't know why, it, <laughs> but it did because I lost the purple that I know and love. So I just changed the back to classic. So I know, oh, that's my team's client. That's the way I like it. It's a little bit of a nuanced thing, but something um, that you may uh, find funny or not used to um, is the theme. And one other thing that you need to be mindful of is in your Windows operating settings, you have notifications here and you allow notifications A to be on. So every Teams message now that you receive in the Teams 2.0 client is actually a Windows notification. It actually uses the operating system notification. So you need to allow notifications to be on in your operating system in Windows 11 to receive the pop-up toast Teams messages that you're, you're used to. So if you go to the Teams 2.0 client, I would make sure that your system notifications is enabled and then choose the appropriate settings that you want for your notifications. So they're 
two of the basic settings of Teams to know that I think you should be looking at if you're going to be trolling the new client. Thank you very much, Justin. Much appreciated the walkthrough there on Teams too. Um, and as usual, if you've got any other questions around that, feel free to reach out. Reach out to us. We've been playing with it for a while, so we're uh, we're pretty familiar with what's uh, what's new, what's different, what is and what isn't working. So if you've got any questions, any concerns, or you've picked anything up, um, yeah, let us know. Thank you. Um, so yeah, again, thank you very much. Have a great day and thanks to our presenters and we'll see you next time.